and hello there again. Today we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 10. That's 2 Corinthians 12, verses 1 to 10. As usual, pause the video, have a read, and we'll have a think about it together. So if you hadn't picked it up yet, the theme of the, really the these, these number of chapters around here is boasting. Uh, Paul is uh, considering the boast that his opponents make, the, the so-called super apostles, uh, and uh, he's boasting himself, but he's boasting in things that are a bit weird. Um, uh, yesterday you saw he boasted in all his sufferings and in his weakness. Um, and today, he starts off chapter 12, he says, I'll go on boasting. Uh, and he, but he doesn't boast of what he himself knows or has happened to him. He boasts that he knows a man in Christ, he knows a man who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Uh, and he, he says, we don't know about this man, only God knows. Uh, he heard inexpressible things that, um, that uh, almost by definition then, he's not permitted to tell. Um, uh, and he said, uh, I'll boast about knowing a man like that, but I won't boast about myself. Now, of course, we read what uh, Paul wrote here and we think, what? Third heaven? Does that mean there's a fourth or fifth or sixth? I've heard of seventh heaven. Does that mean there's levels of heaven? And maybe we could get that vision too. Maybe we could get caught up to that. But notice what Paul said. He knew one man 14 years ago who had had this vision. Think of all the people Paul, I mean, he didn't just stay in one spot. He traveled all over um, a large part of the Roman Empire. He met all sorts of people. And all that time, he knows one man who had one vision one time, who and he can't say anything about it anyway. See, these kind of visions and these uh, of heaven, that sort of thing, they are extraordinarily rare. We should not expect in any way to have one ourselves. And we read something like third heaven. We're not told anything more about it. Uh, Paul's not wanting to tell us about the levels of heaven, like there's first, second, third, fourth. He's just wanting to say, you know what? I've met a man like that. I could boast about that, but I won't. And it's only one man anyway. So it's important for us not to uh, latch on to the really outlandish or the really unusual and expect that to happen to us because that's why it's unusual. It doesn't usually happen and we should not expect it to happen to us at all. In fact, Paul, it, it hadn't even happened to Paul. Paul's not saying this happened to me. He's saying it happened to someone else I know once 14 years ago. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he will not boast um, uh, about that. And he says, even if I did have that, I probably wouldn't boast about it anyway. But then we go on uh, to the what for some people might be well known, the thorn in the flesh. Uh, Paul's verse 7, he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, if I could think, well, this happened to me, I must be really good. Um, uh, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Now, lots of people want to know, what was the thorn? And the simple answer is, no one knows. Well, I suppose Paul does, but he's not around to tell us now. He just tells us it was a thorn in the flesh. Maybe it was persecutions. Maybe it was a particularly frustrating person. Maybe it was illness. Maybe it was, uh, who? it could have been all sorts of things. We don't know anything about what it was, but what we do know is that God, that, that Paul pleaded with God three times to take it away, but God said no. Think about all the things that we have begged God for, that we have desperately wanted God to give us. Perhaps it was the illness of a loved one. Perhaps it was some trouble we're having ourselves. Think about all those things. We say, if only God could give us what we want. A bit like Paul was asking here, three times he pleaded. But what was God's answer? God's answer was no. In fact, it was more than no. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Whatever this messenger of Satan was, whatever this thorn in his flesh was, it weakened him. And he probably was sitting there thinking, if this could be taken away, I could be so much stronger for God. I could do so much more. But God said, no. In fact, 
This thorn is there to show you, to demonstrate to you that all you need is my grace. You don't need more strength on your own. You don't need uh, everything to be just right and all thorns to be removed. You need my, my grace is sufficient for you. In fact, the weaker you are, we saw this a bit yesterday, the more powerful God is. God's power is made perfect in weakness. And so he says, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Think, as we saw yesterday, think of how weak Jesus looked on the cross. If that's how weak he was then, how weak will we look? And yet where was God's power most awesomely displayed? As Jesus hung there on the cross and then as he rose again. In fact, the cross is what cries out to us most of all. My grace is sufficient for you. I don't know how you're feeling now. I can probably guess. You're probably feeling pretty weak, maybe frustrated, maybe helpless. Uh, there's a number of things going on in our church now, if you're watching from Oakhurst, uh, and you'll know how helpless many of us feel. But in our helplessness, that's where God's power is most displayed. And in our helplessness, we can only rely on God's grace and realize that God's grace is sufficient for us. And so Paul says, that's why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Do we actually believe that? When we feel at our weakest, do we actually realize that when we're at our weakest, God is most at work. God is showing his strength even more. For when we're weak, we can fool no one into thinking that the way we persevere is because we've got this inner strength. Everyone can see we're weak. And what they do is give more glory to God, we pray. Because as we persevere, they say, gee, that person, he or she, they must be relying on God's grace. There but for the grace of God, as we say. So today, as we possibly feel very weak, let's remind ourselves that even if God does not remove what weakens us, in fact, especially when God does not remove what weakens us, God is doing that for a reason. God is doing that to remind us that his grace is sufficient for us. And even though we're weak, just keeping on going for Jesus, by God's grace, is all that we need. And as we look weak, let's remember that God's power is being ever more awesomely displayed in our weakness. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thanks. Thank you for the Lord, the Lord Jesus. Thank you that uh, we follow his example of suffering and of, in one sense, looking weak. But thank you that your strength was shown, that Jesus obeyed you and did what you wanted and thereby saved us. And as we struggle with our own weaknesses and with our own thorns, whatever they may be, please help us remember that your grace is sufficient for us. Help us to remember that as the weaker we get, the stronger you are, the stronger you look. The weaker we get, the more your power is evident in us because it's not us at all. Father, thank you that your grace is sufficient for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you tomorrow.